Hello and welcome to my tutorial on star trails. Recently I've been shooting a whole bunch of star trails and have been getting a lot of requests from people on what my techniques that I've been using to shoot star trails are and uh, how you would go about creating these type of wonderful images. So in the next few minutes that we have together I'm going to go through a couple of points, a couple of tips that will help you create some beautiful and amazing star trail shots. All right, so first let's talk about the settings that we're going to have on our camera. One of the most important things when shooting any astro shot is that you have a uh, relatively fast lens. Uh, when you're shooting, you know, for deep space colors, for instance, if you're shooting the Milky Way, it's really, really important that you're shooting somewhere around f2.8 on your aperture setting. Uh, hopefully you all understand what that means. Um, but for star trails, you can have a slightly slower lens and it will still work out. Um, you know, f4 is fine. Um, even f5.6 would work out just fine. What you want to do is you want to switch your camera over to manual. All right, that's the M mode. And hopefully most of your shots are shooting in manual anyway, instead of relying on your camera to do the exposure settings for you. But anyway, that being said, you want to switch over to manual. And you want to go to your fastest aperture you have. Um, that way you're letting in as much light as possible. Uh, stars are very uh, hard to capture, but the, the wider apertures on, your di on a digital camera allow them to be captured. So if it's 2.8, if it's 4, whatever it is, open it up. Next, let's just talk about, um, real quick, your shutter speed. So there's two philosophies on how to do star trails. The first philosophy is that you lock down, um, you lock down your shutter, and you just let it run in a bulb mode. So if you're shooting an hour, you let your you let your shutter run for an hour. I don't like doing that, and the reason I don't like doing that is I find digital sensors heat up too much, and the longer that they're open, the more noise you get in your shot. Um, so when you are open for an hour, even though you have the ability to run at a very low ISO and even stop down your, 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 your f-stop, I still see too much noise in shots. So what I do instead is I use a technique called image stacking, where I shoot 30 second shots continuously, and then afterwards we go and we blend them together. So what you want to do, again, your settings in your camera are going to be manual mode your widest aperture, let's call it 2.8 or f4, and 30 seconds. Then what you want to do is obviously you want to, uh, you know, you need, you need a cable release that you can lock down your shutter with. As for focal length, I try and be on the wider side, uh, 16 millimeters to 24 millimeters when I'm shooting my star trails. Sometimes I do go with a, with a uh, tighter shot, a 50 millimeter or 70 millimeter shot, but one thing you need to keep in mind is the more you zoom in on a shot, the more movement you'll get in the stars. And while that can be a good thing for star trails, one of the things you have to remember is, is the most important thing in your shot actually isn't the star trails. It's the composition of the entire shot. And the more you zoom in, the less sky you're going to be able to show. And the, and, and the less arcs you're going to be able to show around Polaris. So therefore, I tend to shoot it a little bit wider, just making sure I can, I can capture a, a bigger scene, a grander landscape. So that's why I try to remain in that 16 to 24 millimeter range. Uh, again, sometimes zooming in a little bit more, but I try to keep it a little wider just so you can see a little more of the sky and you can see a little more movement. Um, over the entirety of it, as opposed to just this really tight scene with really tight star trails. For ISO settings, I think it's important to um, run at lower ISOs if possible. Meaning, if you're shooting the Milky Way, you might be at ISO 3200 or higher because you want to capture in a very short amount of time a lot of stars and a lot of deep space color. But for star trails, Actually, having too many stars can ruin your star trail. I know it sounds crazy, but 
what happens is you have too many stars rotating in the sky and your image just gets too busy. Look at this example right here. This image shows what happens when you have too many stars in the sky. It's just too busy. However, when you have even less stars, it actually comes out and it actually makes it a better image. All right. So for ISO, I think on most moonless nights, you can get away shooting somewhere in the range of 500 to 1,000. The key here is to actually just take a test shot or two before you start your series, just to make sure your sky is not filled with stars. It's actually going to feel a little bit like you're underexposing. And as a single image, it may not work. However, when you stack them together, the star trails will be brilliant in the sky and will be exactly what you need. So you have to kind of trust me on this. Now that we have our camera settings down, let's talk a little bit about how to compose a good star trail shot. Well, in the Northern Hemisphere, the stars will rotate around the North Star. So how do you find that North Star? Where is it in the sky? Well, obviously, you look north, and it's somewhere in that general direction. Um, but if you look at the image that you see in front of you, you actually, one of the most recognizable constellations in the sky is the Big Dipper. Uh, we've all seen it as a kid. It's actually one of the brightest, and even the city lights, sometimes you can see it. What you want to do is you want to look for the ladle of the Big Dipper, and you want to look for the two outer stars on the label, as you can see in this image. Then you want to draw a line straight through those stars and continue on, and you will reach Polaris. Now, since these stars rotate around Polaris in a counterclockwise direction, you can choose to either include that in your shot so you get a complete circle or not so you get arcs. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't shoot star trails in different directions. As you see here in this Pigeon Point Lighthouse shot, there are star trails arcing in two different directions. That's because I was facing basically west. That was a compositional decision I made. So while convention will tell you that you need to face north or include Polaris, you don't have to. It's a very nice thing to do, but it actually um, is, is a rule that can be broken if you need to. As with all landscape photography, your shot is only as good as your composition. That's true too with star trails. Star trails in and of themselves do not make a good photo, but they're one part of a bigger element that can create a stunning and captivating photo. So when choosing your composition, you want to have some elements in it in the foreground that are compelling elements. You need to think the same way you think about a sunset shot or a sunrise shot. You need to think what, where your leading lines are, where your horizon is, what your foreground, midground, background is, and compose a shot, and then have the star trails be an element in that shot. As you can see in this example that I put up, I've used balanced rock in Arches National Park as a way of um, as a way of leading yourself into the star trails. However, balanced rock is actually the main element in the shot, not star trails. Since the foreground is such an important aspect of a star trail shot, you need to actually think about how it's lit. It's dark out, and you need to make sure you can actually see the rocks or see the landscape or whatever it is. So there's two options here. One is that you can shoot, and this is actually my preferred method, you can shoot on a night that has some moonlight. You don't want too much. Probably anything over 60 or 70% illumination of the moon is too much. And well, actually, you won't see enough stars in the sky. But uh, in that 20 to 60 or 70% range, you're actually getting some great lighting on the landscape, and it's actually uh, causing you to get a nice blue sky, a nice, uh, you know, not too many stars in the sky, so it's, it's actually optimal conditions for a star trail shot. However, if you're shooting on a moonless night, what you need to do is you need to think about light painting the, uh, the foreground. So obviously you need to have one or two elements in it that you're going to paint. 
Uh, the preferred way that I do this is I use two Coleman lanterns. They're very even illumination. And what I will do is, since we're going to be shooting a series of shots, I will illuminate the first one and the last one. The reason I do this is because there's no reason to light paint every shot. It's just a pain. <laughs> and when you stack your images together, as we're going to talk about in part two of this tutorial, it takes the lightest image and actually uses the lightest image. So it doesn't matter that the other images are dark. Now, the reason I shoot one in the beginning and one at the end is actually a safety issue. If for whatever reason your first shot that you light painted didn't come out, now you have a backup in your last shot and you can still have continuous uh, star trails going throughout. So now you're ready to begin shooting. You have your foreground selected, you know how it's being lit, whether by moonlight or light painting. You have your camera settings down, you know where you're aiming, and you're ready to go. The question is, how long? How long do I need to shoot star trails for? Well, technically, anything over 30 seconds, you're already going to see some movement in the stars. But the rule of thumb is that the stars move approximately 2.5 degrees every 10 minutes in the sky. So a complete arc is going to take, obviously, hours a complete 360. However, since there's a lot of stars in the sky, you don't need it. Generally, I feel the optimal amount of time when you're including Polaris in a shot shot, and I'll explain why this is in a second, is somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour and a half. You want to lock down your, your camera, and you want to continuously shoot those 30 second shots for 45 minutes to an hour and a half. You can let it go longer, but I feel at that point, the trails actually sometimes get too long, and again, you get too busy of a sky. Now, when you're not shooting at Polaris, or not including in the shot, so you're either getting just arcs, or uh, arcs going in different directions because you're facing east or west, I think you can actually shoot uh, l uh, shorter star trail shots, because the arcs get longer and longer and longer the further away you get from Polaris, so you'll get pretty long arcs in a shot um, in, a, in a shot that's maybe 20 minutes long. So if you look at this shot here, this is something that was not facing Polaris. This is obviously facing east in Yosemite, but it still has nice long arcs, even though it was probably only a 25 minute exposure or stacked images over 25 minutes. So now that you've decided how long you're going to shoot, you know your settings, you're ready to go. Now just lock down your trigger and let your star trail shots run. Keep an eye out for part two of this tutorial, which will be developing these shots and stacking them into one image. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and hope you found the information very helpful. Have a great day.